Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar where today we'll be exploring zero trust security for banking and financial services. My name is Connor Beechenor and I'll be your moderator for this session and today I'm delighted to welcome both Ricardo Oliveira and Franco Camba who are both on our solutions engineering team here at HashiCorp and they'll be your speakers today. In terms of the agenda, we'll start with a quick overview of HashiCorp before exploring the current banking and financial services landscape, and ultimately how this and the organizations within it can implement a zero trust security strategy. We'll then wrap up with a live Q&A, so if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll get back to you at the end of the session. Please note that this webinar is also recorded and we'll send that out to you as well as the slides that you see today after it's been processed, usually within a day or two. So with that, over to you, Ricardo. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Connor. So today we're going to go through Zero Trust Security for Banking and Financial Services. So this is a dedicated session for uh, the financial services industry. Uh, I'm Ricardo and I'm here with uh, Franco. So I've been a software developer, systems engineer and so on for several years. And I've been at HashiCorp now for about three years um, where I started you know, to get in contact with the uh, HashiCorp solutions. And uh, Franco, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yes, hi everyone, my name is Franco Camba. I'm a surgeons engineer here at HashiCorp and I work in the same team as Ricardo and today we'll be presenting on Zero Trust. Nice to meet you all. So, in terms of, uh, sorry, the slides are a bit slow here. Okay, so just to start off, like as a quick introduction to HashiCorp, who we are really as a company, because you may have heard of some of our products, but not necessarily uh, recognize the brand. So, HashiCorp, our motto that infrastructure enables innovation, is a company dedicated to make tools that allow us and products that allow us to provision, secure, connect, and run our applications and our infrastructure, All right? So it's, uh, and it, so we have actually a set of tools and a set of solutions uh, for our customers that we have now about 2,000, uh, so 2,500 uh, enterprise customers. We've been found, we've started in 2012 and we did an IPO in 2021. So it means that, uh, yeah, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. And we've grown massively now with uh, 2,300 um, 2, employees. So these, is, these are just some of the statistics from our company. And really, if we, why do we exist here? It's our goal is to, look into the so there's a lot of things on this slide but our goal is to look on how applications now migrating from having a private data center from on premise into the cloud into this whole more dynamic way of working right when we say cloud it doesn't mean necessarily it's a, a service provider but it could also be your own internal cloud it's just more of a, a mindset rather than a location Right. So we're trying to move applications from one paradigm to the other. And by applications means also our infrastructure. So everything from the application down also needs to follow that same paradigm. So if we start from the bottom in terms of the provisioning aspect of it, we used to have dedicated servers and we're now moving over to uh, infrastructure as code. Right. As in, like we're trying to find a way to represent this, this infrastructure, a way to, that we can dynamically uh, change it. In terms of security, in your data center where you'd have IP-based security, so everyone would always trust which applications are running on a certain IP address, so you'd know and have a, a spreadsheet. Once you're going over to the cloud, the IPs change, um, and also the location of where these applications are keep, keeps changing, right? So that's why we need to start enforcing identity in that case. In terms of the connection, also we used to associate very much like, okay, we have a host name, we have an IP address, we know who you are. Again, when we're going more into the cloud and dynamic type of paradigm, 
everything is always changing, right? So we, that means that we have host names change, IP addresses change. We should not, those should not be our only um, attributes for trust. And then at the end, in terms of where we run our application. So if we, if we, if we built out all of the stack of um, virtual machines, so hardware, virtual machines, our network is there, then we need to have something that also is running and orchestrating these applications across. We used to have dedicated infrastructure, so we know which server we need to replace that's running that application. That's no longer the case on a cloud type and dynamic dash dynamic mindset. So what happens is that we're going through this move where on the same hardware, we can have multiple type of workloads, right? We can have Docker containers, we can have Java processes and, and so on. Um, sorry, Franco, I've lost. Okay, great stuff. Thank you. So what are our products, right? So for each one of these uh, layers that I mentioned, we have products that address workflow portability, for example, Terraform and Packer. So that means that they deal with infrastructure as code, compliance and governance. How, how do you make sure that you keep the same workflow across the different clouds, across your hybrid environment, right? Being image provisioning or uh, for infrastructure provisioning. And then console uh, on the networking side for service discovery, service mesh, and so on. So that allows you to achieve network portability, right? So that, which means that uh, independently of what platform it's running on, which cloud it's running on, you still be able to discover applications and connect them, right? Uh, so you'd be able to bridge that gap. And then you have identity and access management portability, the security piece, which is the one that we'll be focusing on today, mostly, uh, with Vault and Boundary, with the uh, identity brokerage, secrets management, and so on. Because if you're if you're having multiple clouds, which one is actually determining your identity, right? You, as usually you, a, you, a human is logging in, that's pretty much that. You have your Azure AD, your Active Directory, your single sign-on, Okta, et cetera. So you have several solutions there. Uh, and you have one that you define, this is my single source of truth. When it comes to the like machine identity and application identity, which one is the one that's your single source of truth? Because you have multiple of those, right? And then finally, on the application side, to make sure that your workloads are portable, uh, Nomad and Waypoint take care of these. Waypoint takes care that your pipelines are portable across different CI CD platforms, different version control systems, different uh, clouds, et cetera. Right. And Nomad is so Waypoint is doing the deployment of applications and managing their lifecycle. And Nomad is the one that's running the applications, making sure they're up, you know, that they're evenly distributed uh, or they're tightly packed as well. It depends on what's your strategy there in terms of orchestration. And it's running, of course. Bash scripts, Java processes, VMs, or even uh, con Docker containers, or Podman containers, etc. Right. So all of that is on our workload portability. And then, in terms of what we offer, we have two sides. It, they can either be on the, on the cloud, right? So where we take care of all of the identity audit, logging, billing, upgrades, patching, auto scaling for you, and so on. So we have our cloud services for that, or we also have self managed and our open source solutions. So all of those that you've seen here are open source and they can all work independently from each other. Right? It doesn't mean that suddenly you're installing all six applications or anything like that. You just go with a problem you're trying to solve. Okay? Hopefully that was clear here. Um, in terms of how, let's say, who is using our products? Who do we enable? We focus mostly also on the Actually, we focus mostly on the platform team, right? So our products allow you allows that platform team and that cloud platform team to set up an interface with their application developments team, right? So you have all all the primitives there to make the platform team successful, and that's that's really our goal. So now that we know who HashCorp is, what are some of our products? Going to just talk a little bit about our current regulations, uh, current challenges, and 
bit of the latest uh, regulation. So I'm not going to be covering everything, of course, that the financial service industry needs to address, but the most recent ones, right? So if we look at generic, generically, right, some of the challenges that they're trying to address. We're trying to improve the customer experience, right? It's all about getting more customers onto our platform, into our banking platform. And we do that by having to iterate rapidly and quickly and add new features to it. Uh, so we're trying to decrease the time to market and still for that have uh, adopt all of the cloud services, right? You want to adopt more advanced analytics. You want to you have a set of projects that need this type of burstable capacity that you want to implement in the cloud, but how do you make sure that you're iterating fast enough and delivering that in a way that's compliant as well? So the second point about ensuring compliance where the, the platform underneath you is always changing. Today you're Azure Cloud, tomorrow you're GCP. So you need to be able to still ensure compliance regardless of which platform is changing, uh, you're using. And then of course, you want to make sure you're spending your uh, pounds, euros, dollars, <laughs> whatever your, your currency of choice is efficiently and that you're able to control those costs, right? You need to have visibility of what you're spending so that you can decide where to spend it best, where it's best spent, right? Um, and then you can evaluate, well, is the application spending too much? Is it not? Is, is it, am I getting the return that I expect as a business from investing in this application? So for some of you, Think about like, what is your current position right now? Do you have an aging infrastructure currently and you need to renew it? Do you have any core software that's not maintainable anymore? It's just been, um, you know, lying there in the corner. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. Or are you here because you're looking to increase API usage and you start, you are coming in with a mentality to adopt like API first strategy. You know, that means you're trying to do away with all of the, well, tickets, ticketing systems, and also any type of like pull requests and things like that. So going more of an API first strategy. Or what's happening in your company? Are you trying to create this cloud expertise or this platform expertise within your company? Uh, and how do you also adapt the processes that you have for be, to be compliant for risk and governance, right? And then how do you comply with all of that? So, so in terms of expectations from those like re these uh, regulatory bodies, there, there's two of them that I'll talk about, I'll touch uh, briefly. So it's about the Digital Operational Resilience Act and DORA, right? And then um, SOX reporting. So if, okay, so what is DORA? So really quick, uh, DORA is part of more a, a wider type of package from, from EU. Uh, but it's when, when we say EU, it's also applicable to the UK market, right? It was pioneered by the papers released by Bank of England. So this is something that's quite um, important for us here at uh, in EU. Now it sets a set of requirements to make sure that critical third parties, for example, your, your cloud platforms and your data analytics, analytics services are resilient enough, right? So that's briefly what it is. Some of the requirements uh, that they have on the financial service industry is that you need to prove that you can prevent, mitigate, withstand, respond to, and recover from any cyber th uh, threats, right? So, and also any kind of disruption of, of your cloud platform. So let's say for, for example, tomorrow, um, your Google identity service goes away. What happens? No one can log in, no one can use your platform, your services lose all of the identity. How, what, is your, what does your hybrid uh, strategy look like? How are you able to migrate and recover from that, right? Uh, Amazon, Route 53 stops working. What's your mitigation from that? Okay, so that these are the type of things that you need to think about like, well, how am I going to mitigate this risk and prove that I can mitigate it? And something, uh, a term very particular that uh, Dora mentions too are about exit strategies or exit plans. 
which means you need to be able to have these exit plans of any type of technology that you own. So if you buy into something, you need to have an exit plan, a way to be able to move from it. Okay, so you need to always have an exit plan so that you, you can mitigate in case that business that's producing that product goes bust, then you need to be able to move off it. Okay, and ensure that there's business continuity, re reduce disruption and so on, right? And all of this, of course, has its own consequence. If you do not prove that you can do all of this, then of course there's, you know, there's fines, there's jail time, et cetera. So that's quite uh, a thing here. Uh, hopefully if there are any questions, by the way, please, uh, I believe we have a chat somewhere here. Uh, you'd be able to put them there, I believe, and then we can pick them up. Okay. So in terms of uh, SOX reporting, so if we look at that section, section 404 of SOX, it, that, that's exactly the, the sentence there, that we need to have adequate controls and checks and balances in place for any of the systems that you have in your, um, in your company. So it means any financial system, systems, financial reporting. However, about 90% or, or more of this is all in digital format, right? So if this is all in digital format, it means you need, means you need to apply those controls, checks and balances, in digital format as well. So it's not just about having the process, you need to be able to prove, yes, I have this, this is how I have everything being audited, right? So it means everything that's any piece of software that you own, you need to be generating audit logs from it, okay? Any piece of software that you own, it needs to have strong time-based authentication and authorization. So you need to have this notion of identity across all of your applications and all of your systems and what they can access. And of course, if you notice, if you have several of these identity systems and machine identity systems spread out, how, do you, how are you able to collect all that auditable information in one to be able to give it to your auditor, right? You need to be able to chase and knock every single different door. It just takes time and it's cumbersome. And then you have, uh, finally, encryption. You have to prove that everything's encrypted in transit, at rest, and and that you're using the you know allowed, let's say, validated encryption algorithms. Well, how do you prove also that you're using the only the approved algorithms of for encryption, right? So this is what uh, some of the requirements of the regulation of th that we had. So if we look at this, I only mentioned a couple of them, a couple of the regulatory requirements. The last one, it's about risks. These are the main risks, right? Operational risk. Think of what is your hybrid strategy? How compliant is it, right? Uh, are you able, is it actually hybrid? Can you move a workload from A to B? And what does the disruption look like? Okay. And can you prove it? Governance. How do you make sure that although you're trying to move faster and iterate faster, you still have all of those approvals, checks and balances in place as an application as promoted across environments, right? And then data sovereignty, like, do you make sure that you're keeping the data uh, safe and separating the data across uh, different countries? And finally, security. That means that security should be useful to mitigate some of the risks highlighted above. Right, but you need to be able to ship left as in like put security as in front right at the start uh, of your process as in like when you're building an image you should be already scanning uh, for faults or anything there before you even deploy the image you should be scanning the infrastructure to make sure that your infrastructure is um, you know sound so even before you apply uh, an infrastructure as in when it finally gets stood up. Before it gets set up, you need to be able to validate that that infrastructure is not going to break any type of um, policy that you have. Right, and this is where I hand over uh, to my esteemed colleague Franco to talk and take us through a zero trust security solution. So you should be able to hear me and uh, let me actually take it away. Thank you, Ricardo. So in this part, we wanted to uh, really talk about how Zero Trust plays a role in all of this. 
uh, what do we mean by zero trust Satoshi Corp? And really go shift gears a little bit and, and talk about maybe a little bit more practical ways to, to implement this and how zero trust can help essentially. I wanted to latch on the, the notion that Ricardo mentioned at the very beginning and, and specifically on why we exist. And uh, uh, we, we have seen the shift from companies uh, that are moving from traditional ways of, of securing their infrastructure, which we tend to refer to the, the custom model of how they were securing data centers traditionally, where you the focus was entirely placed on securing the perimeter and, uh, and really securing those ingress and egress points where information was coming in and out of this, of this perimeter. So with, net, with, with firewalls, with, with appliances, with proxies. And uh, in this model, which worked pretty well um, uh, for, for in that scenario, um, the, the, the concept of trust was, uh, uh, was, was implicit. So if you're running inside the, the corporate network, then you get an IP address from the network and you're implicitly trusted. And things were a little bit static. So typically your workloads are on mainframes or, or on, on, on machines that don't actually change that much. And that worked for in, uh, and, and, and still work for companies that are running on primary or on a single data center. The challenge there is what happens when you start adding another data center? What happens when you start adopting cloud services or SaaS services? This is where this model starts to break down and becomes very impractical and also um, not adapt to, to, to really um, secure this new environment where we are basically uh, ending up with in, in, in the recent days. So really there is kind of a, a contrast. And uh, if you look at what's, what is a modern data center, which can be a cloud, but it can also just be a data center, um, everything becomes more dynamic. So applications are ephemeral. They are, instead of scaling them up, they are being scaled out. And, uh, and uh, things come and goes. If you think in the cloud, if you think about containers, um, uh, things are actually explode in the order of magnitude and becomes way more dynamic. Um, everything becomes an API. And this is a key point in, in the security part. So we, we, cannot, we cannot anymore think about the API on securing that. We need to think about a different, a different thing of sec uh, when it comes to security, which, which is basically its identity. So everything becomes identity driven. And, uh, and, and in this scenario, because we are now, now um, in, in a world where we still have our data centers, but we still have cloud services and APIs, we cannot anymore think of a perimeter. So the notion of perimeter moves away and we suddenly are in a, in a, in a, in a world where the network is suddenly untrusted. So we need to really think of that we are in this untrusted network and we need to really think about the security model. This is really where zero trust comes in on rethinking the security model of this new world where we, where we are basically in at the moment. If we look at them from, from the attack perspective, while we appreciate that every cyber attack is different, that's, that's set in stone, but we can also agree that uh, the pattern within the attacks are pretty much the same or very similar every time. So typically an attacker will try to grab initial access. This can be either through infecting a device, through trying to um, maliciously uh, uh, store, steal an identity, or potentially even just purchasing this, uh, this information from the black market after they have been already breached. But again, but again the, an attacker will try to get an initial footstep on, on the network and then Typically, the second phase is, is a process of scanning the network, understanding, okay, what's in there? Is there any um, sensitive information like a secrets, like credentials, like service account keys that are available in plain text that I can actually grab? And the intention is really to scan the network, find this key piece of information and elevate the credential up to the point where this lateral movement culminates into a point where the attacker actually has access to a system containing sensitive data. This can be your customer data, this can be transaction data, this can be data that can, if exfiltrated, be very valuable outside, outside your company, can be sold, can be actually, you maybe actually requested a ransom. And uh, you, know the, you know the implications of this, there can be reputational damage, there could be fines from a regulator. And, uh, and you might be thinking, okay, where is, where is zero trust place in all of this? So there is, uh, and we can talk about what zero trust is just shortly, but there is research showing that companies who adopt zero trust security strategy actually can mitigate better an attack like this, can actually have a reduced blast radius and can really cope better against attacks like these ones. 
and uh, and this is really why zero trust is gaining so much traction this is why we, we believe it's uh, it's kind of essential in in, uh, in protecting um, uh, today's infrastructure and today's modern architectures so all of this is nice so what is zero trust so there is no i would say official definition of zero trust but i believe there are three commonly agreed principles by the industry around it that define in a way the, the zero trust principles and zero trust is not a product zero trust is not a, a solution it's i would say it's a set of principles and uh, typically the, the the industry agreed on principle number one is authenticate and authorize everything so you need because we are now in this untrusted world untrusted network you really want to authenticate and authorize every single interaction even by the same application so we st we still want to authenticate and authorize and also audit and log every single interaction that's it that's a key part of this of this strategy the second one is assuming breach which means that you should design uh, uh, your system and your controls thinking that an attacker might already be inside the network and this might revert to okay uh, instead of just limiting ourselves to encryption at rest and in transit why don't we then encrypt the data at application level? So before we are committing data or transactions to a storage system, we actually do a further encryption at the application level and we store data encrypted. The third principle is, principle is uh, least privilege. Now we hear least privilege everywhere and there is a reason why. What we intend at AshiCorp on least privilege is obviously is reducing the amount of permissions that the our applications that our, 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 and our users have to the minimum that they need to do their job and don't allow anything more than that. So we can really prevent in the, in the case of lateral movement we've seen before, we can really minimize, not prevent, minimize the, 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 the probability of a lateral movement. At Ashikorp, we also very, we, are, uh, we want to put an emphasis on time. Time is also very important. We also want to provide permissions that are actually valid only for a specific time frame and then they get automatically they automatically expire after that time to leave that is extremely important provides another layer layer of security on top of that so imagine that these credentials are actually are stolen but they're expired these credentials are actually useless finally obviously encryption is very important and auditing as ricardo mentioned auditing and logging it's extremely important especially now in this world where it's so dynamic that we with, with containers with apis we the, the order of magnitude is exploding and auditing and logging is becoming even more important. And uh, okay, these are, the, these are the principles to what we apply that. We apply that to networks, we apply that to humans, and we apply that to machines. So these are the three principal objects that we want to apply these principles on. And uh, what is the challenge? The challenge is that companies are now, um, if they want to adopt these principles, uh, they really need to uh, uh, apply them across a plethora of heterogeneous uh, entities or, or uh, for, for infrastructure on-premise, they may actually use something like VMware. They may actually use two different cloud, prevent, cloud, cloud providers. They may actually have VMs for, in, from some workloads and containers for others. So the, the, the struggle here is how, do you do your, how can you apply this set of principles in a consistent way across heterogeneous environments? And this is really where we come in because everything we do, as, as Ricardo mentioned, it's technology agnostic. So our, our tools and our solutions works either way, whether if you have VMware, whether you have Azure, AWS or Google, any cloud, or whether you run on containers or VMs. So our solutions are in a way technology agnostic and we want to, our, our essential value proposition is really around providing you a consistent workflow that works across the technology stack. And with our tool, we believe we can enable you to really implement zero trust strategy. So if you want to start, the, 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 the principle number one is authorize and authenticate and authorize everything. And it really starts from an identity. The issue there is identity. As Ricardo mentioned, it's very complex. And uh, even at a single layer, for example, uh, uh, at the application, there are many different authentication methods that you might be using at the same time. So Kubernetes may be the, the authentication type for your containers running on, on, on Kubernetes, but, but then you may have other applications running on VMs that they actually use JWT, they may, actually, they may be actually be using something different. And the same applies for networks, for users, for cloud. And uh, this explosion of complexity makes really adopting that first principle, authenticating and authorize everything in a consistent way, very difficult. So this is where we, the first step where we come in and uh, 
we, be, we really believe that entity is the pillar for any multi-cloud security strategy. And uh, everything that we will say from that this point onwards is based on identity. So if we start from our proposition, if you look at the machine side of things, so the machine to machine authentication authorization, we uh, built a solution called Ashcorp Vault in, I believe in 2015. And Vault essentially is aimed at all the aspects of machine to machine secret exchange. And uh, the way we can, Vault can do that is tr be, by being a, an identity broker. So Vault can really intermediate uh, uh, all the authentication authorization um, uh, process for, for every secret exchange. And uh, the reason we can do that is because it it's can brokerage all the different identities that you might have in your, in your, in your enterprise. And uh, the, the beauty here is that you can centralize and unify this, uh, this approach and you can really pull vault, put Vault in front of the most sensitive systems that you have, like a database, like uh, uh, your, your PKI infrastructure, your, an encryption endpoint, and really use Vault as an identity broker to access and consume those, those sensitive systems. So how does Vault works? If you look on the right hand side and if you look at the picture, there are three main objects. There's clients, there's authentications, there's systems. And uh, typically a client will be a human or a machine, typically it's an application um, that will first access Vault and in the first thing that we'll need to authenticate. Now the client will present its own identity. So in this case, uh, depending on the client or the application, they will be using uh, uh, the, the, the identity that they are familiar with. So Active Directory or, or IAM or Okta or Kubernetes. And what the beauty here is Vault integrates with those identity providers. So you don't have to create new identities. We, we will actually can authenticate your, your existing identity. Upon authentication, then Vault policies kicks in. And the Vault policies is how Vault provides you authorization on what you can do, what the client can do and cannot do. And uh, the, the final part is, is the system. So there are systems that Vault can integrate with like databases, like encryption endpoints, like PKI infrastructure that basically Vault exposed through this this um, uh, this uh, this workflow and uh, and and really this workflow is repeated across many use cases uh, the beauty here is we can unify the workflow and we can actually automate it because vault it provides you an api and can be fully automated now there's enough jargon there tell me a little bit about about use cases that we see in the market for vault the, the first use case that we see implemented is on-demand dynamic sequence. So imagine that you have a database uh, that you want to front that with Vault. And what you can do, uh, you can actually have clients that go through Vault and get a just-in-time uh, set of credentials to access the database that is generated on-demand. This set of credentials is dynamic, meaning that it has a time to leave. And uh, after a time to leave, Vault automatically revoke these credentials from the database system. Why is this? useful because we are suddenly removing secret sprawl we are suddenly removing those database um, set of credentials that are floating around in a, in a plain text file they never expire and they are shared amongst developers we are now uh, automating that process making it more secure and really removing any all the sprawl of these credentials and because everything is now handled and managed by vault the addition the, the added value is that we are also tracking and auditing every single vault request so every single credential that has been uh, leased is tracked and audited by Vault. Vault can also be used as a static um, a, a object storage. So there is a key value store within Vault. And you can actually use Vault as well for storing uh, things like keys, um, um, API tokens, and, uh, and other secrets within Vault itself. And then again, use that workflow for accessing, for um, remo removing access or restricting access and also for versioning and all of that and through the Vault API. Finally, Vault can also be used as an encryption mechanism. So Vault can be, you can actually create encryption keys within Vault and use Vault as kind of a, an encryption API that your developer will just need to do encryption as a service and they will basically get encrypted data as a result. What is the beauty there is that developers don't need anymore to be crypto expert. They can actually get this as a service from Vault. They just hit an endpoint, re receive encryption data, encrypted data, but also the encryption keys never leave Vault. So we're actually 
heavily securing that process because now the encryption keys are never exposed. They, they can be automatically rotated by Vault and, uh, and you can actually restrict who can actually really can ad operate the encryption keys as well. So there's, it's a it's pretty, it's pretty uh, interesting proposition there. So with that, let's move to the second part. We talked about the machine. Let's look at it a little bit more at the, around, around the network. And uh, we, we talked about measuring the, the, the custom model, the, the, the traditional model of data center. And how is that not so adapt to the modern world? And in this space, we built a, a solution called Ashicrop Console. And with console, what you can essentially do is really run a high level of automation within your network. And by doing that, we believe you can actually adopt as well pretty, pretty much better than the zero trust principles that we discussed before. And the, the common characteristics that we mentioned before, they, they, they are still there. Console can run essentially on any environment, so on-premise, on the cloud works is compatible with Kubernetes, with containers, but also with virtual machines. So you can actually run that consistent way across different set of environments. So what can you do with console? So the primary use case is service discovery. So typically imagine that you have a new application coming online. What you can have with console is that that application automatically register itself within console through the mean of having a console agent uh, that is running in the host or as a sidecar container the application becomes kind of unaware of that, but gets automatically registered with console. And with this approach, we can not only know where things are running, uh, but we also do, console also does health checks. So we know where things are run and, and also we know their status in terms of health. And uh, this is extremely important in this dynamic world because things are, we suddenly are explosion of containers and, and, and VMs. We suddenly have a tool that tells us exactly in every specific moment where things are running, at which address, and if they're healthy or not. So that is the primary use case is, is a, a service discovery. Once we know where things are running, then how do we secure the, inter the, the exchange of information? So console provides you the entire infrastructure to build mutual TLS. So there is no need for you to procure uh, CAs, pay for them. Console provides you all the tools to actually build that uh, infrastructure for, for basically building the um, mutual authentication amongst different services. And finally, okay, we can we, we secure the information exchange, but how can we then govern and do, that, do, that, do the authorization layer? Because now we are using certificates to identify services. We can now actually govern who can co connect to what. So we can do with console, we can do traffic shaping. And obviously that the, the other king use case with console is service mesh. So you might actually wondering who is using console. One of, one of the examples that uh, uh, the, probably the, one of the best example is Stripe. So a, Stripe is a global payment uh, infrastructure. And uh, what they do, they use console as their service mesh over thousands and thousands of nodes globally. So there is a, there is a nice video at Ashikov of them talking about how they implemented console and what do they use console for? So we talked about machines, we talked about network, but we don't want to leave the humans behind, right? Uh, after all, we are, still, we, are still, we are still here. So this has become extremely important, especially recently with the pandemic, because companies were catapulted in an all remote environment. And, uh, but humans still needed to access the corporate machines and uh, the corporate uh, resources, right? So traditionally, this has been done through VPNs, which uh, probably don't need to tell you there are uh, there are many drawbacks of using VPNs. And simply put, they don't scale with the uh, the current environment where we are in, right? With this modern world. So Ashikor Boundary is a solution that is meant to tackle this problem in a different way, with looking at more at the zero trust, looking at more at those principles. And, uh, and this is the, the last pillar of this multi-cloud security strategy that we want to propose. So the workflow, it's similar to what you have seen before and as simple as well. The very first thing is always authentication. So users will basically will authenticate to Boundary using their own identity, uh, whether you're using Active Directory, Okta, any SAML or any cloud account, users will be able to go to Boundary and, and, and authenticate with those. And uh, that is extremely important. There is another in interesting thing that Bandari integrates with Vault as an identity broker. So Bandari can actually leverage Vault as an identity broker in the authentication phase. 
again, extending the realm of authentication methods that can be used. But again, we want to enforce strong authentication because then whenever we, a user is authenticated, then is presented with a list of things based on identity that can access. So the authorization phase is really important. Users are presented with a catalog of resources that they can access. Uh, this can be VMs, this can be containers, this can be databases, right? And uh, and this this list of resources, this catalog, the one of the one of the things with Bandari is really want to work as well on the user experience. There is a feature called uh, dynamic discovery of 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 targets where Bandari can automatically add new targets into the catalog uh, uh, automatically following some specific parameters, right? And again, users will be automatically able to find them in the catalog. But okay, users find this, these targets. How? What are the access mechanisms? That's the access mechanisms are the ones that you expect: SSH, RDP, or or for example, database connections. And here comes another differentiator for boundary: is that okay? Uh, let's say users need to access the database; they will still need to have the username and password to actually log in. But what boundary can do at this stage is in boundary can integrate Vault and can actually automatically inject dynamic database credentials in the connection string. So the user doesn't have to ever see these credentials, doesn't have to handle them, and is already presented at the con after the connection with the database login done in, uh, on behalf of the user for boundary. And now this is, provides you better security because credentials do not float around. The credentials are ephemeral, but also provides a better user experience because users don't have to manage that. And there are actually less intermediation as well for them. Typically at this point, people ask, okay, how does boundary work? Um, we wanted to keep it simple because this can be a very long discussion, but essentially there are two components of boundary. There is a control plane that house the uh, configuration of boundary and also governs the authentication part. So users uh, will need to connect to the control plane to authenticate to boundary. And this is the component that need to be sitting in a, uh, an environment that is reachable by the users, can be sitting on premise, can be also be hosted by our from our HCP cloud. And uh, and once users authenticate, they are presented with a set of catalog. They will then pick a target system. This is where the second component of boundary comes into place, the boundary worker. The boundary worker is the is the component that the users will ultimately, from a network perspective, connect in order to access the target, the, the target system. And the beauty here is that the users will never, from a network perspective, really jump on the target system or connect to that. They will be actually connecting to the worker and the worker will be proxying this connection to the target system. And the idea here is we want to minimize the network footprint or we want to minimize the network access that users using Boundary have by actually only allowing them to connect to the workers. We also have uh, new features coming up uh, that has been also um, uh, mentioned during AshiConf that will allow us to have uh, multi-hop workers where, again, we can um, work with those scenarios that have very high um, uh, level of protection when it comes to networking and really make sure that users only connect to the very, very last uh, first mile of the, of the hop. And up until that point, the connection is proxied to the target system. Um, we also we, we mentioned Vault and we, we mentioned that there is, a, there is a Vault integration with Boundary and that works both from the authentication perspective but also from the credential injection. And uh, what are the benefits? We, we briefly mentioned we want to obviously obey to all the security principles of zero trust. So authentic, strong authentication, authorization. But uh, at the same time, we wanted to provide a different experience for developers. We want to really, or, and for operators, really want to make that a better experience. And, and we, we use Vault for both, for improving the security footprint, but also for, for improving the, the, the experience for developers. And finally, obviously, we really want to provide a solution that doesn't bring you right into the network and, and really limit the exposures to, of network exposures of, of users. And so these are the three primary benefits of Boundary. Now, if you make a step back, if you look at the, uh, the attack uh, patterns that we've seen before, we can now see that how by using a, a combination of, of tools and strategies, you can really mitigate 
or, or you can really uh, reduce the chance uh, and, and potential blast radius of every single phase of this attack. And uh, um, what we really want to have is really have this defense in depth and layered defense in depth that really makes the life of an attacker as difficult as possible. And this is how we approach security from a strategy perspective. Now, Ricardo also mentioned, I want to really uh, emphasize it again. Typically at this point, company asks, okay, how can we deploy this, these tools? There are normally two flavors. You can actually uh, manage them yourself. So you will install the binary uh, on-premise or in the cloud, but you will be installing them and managing them from an operational standpoint. But the other flavor is that we are now offering them as managed services. So it's something called Ashikop Cloud Platform. And we offer Vault, Bundle and Console as managed services in there. So we actually uh, manage them for you and you will just basically be consuming them from, from, from the platform. We are be becoming essentially your SRE. And, uh, and this is really um, the st our strategy around uh, multi-cloud security. It never focus only on one thing. It's not a single solution. It's a strategy that focuses on securing machine to machines, securing networks, securing how humans also access machines. And, uh, and we believe it's a very strong value proposition because it's technology agnostic, because it's really uh, allowing, you to, allowing you to adopt zero trust across the board without focusing too much on the underlying technology. I'll, uh, with that, I will, it's the end of this content. I will pass it on to, to Connor for closing it and maybe we can open up for questions as well. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Franco, and to Ricardo as well. Um, so before we get into the next steps, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. So just starting from the top, um, Vault as an encryption API, is that currently FIPS compliant? We can, we can share more information about that. There are several levels of FIPS compliance uh, and we will need to check which level you're looking for. But um, uh, you can, if you, if you Google it, yes, you, you will find that uh, Vault is being uh, FIPS compliant for several levels. But obviously there, are, there is a new one, I believe, that is coming up. We need to double check if that's the case. Yeah, I've, I've sent a, a link over to the question on the Q&A chat. Yes, it, it is Vault Enterprise is FIPS compliant. Um, we have a binary that's FIPS 140-2 um, level one compliant, right? If you want level two, level three, then you need to combine Vault with NHSM. But yes, FIPS compliance is there. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, next question is, what are the biggest challenges you see when implementing a zero trust strategy today? So I guess I, I can answer on, on my part. One of the biggest challenges sometimes on implementing zero trust is when you try to boil the ocean, right? It's when you try to do everything and then it doesn't really work. So our suggestion is to start small with a pilot, right? Make sure you apply to one application and then you take the learnings from that and you iterate and you scale it up right to the rest of the applications. Uh, that comes from having, you know, um, a more detailed, let's say, application onboarding strategy, so you can onboard into your uh, zero trust security. That's my my take on it. Franco, you're on, you're on mute. I think you're talking, but yes, I'm not sure you're able to hear me. Um, yes, also I would say. There's probably a misconception at times that zero trust is a product or it's a, it's a tool. It's really should be is a strategy, which means that should be um, uh, should be approached from from a strategic point of view, from with, with with planning. And it's it's really never something that you can switch on overnight. So uh, that that is probably the biggest challenge is really to to sit down and, and approach that from a strategic perspective rather than from 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 a technology or starting from the technology. Great, thank you. And then the last question that we have is um, transitioning to this zero tr trust model sounds like a lot of work. Uh, I'm wondering if companies hire people who have previous experience with Vault or zero trust models, or do you see teams learning everything on their own? What are you kind of seeing within the, the customers that you're talking to at the moment?
Sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay. So, so in my case, yeah, what I see that, you know, that, that's why we also have, we have self-managed offerings and we have the cloud managed offerings. So that re takes off some of the work there in terms of like supporting patching and so on. Uh, but st the strategy itself, we do have our professional services that can come in and help out to devise better that strategy, right? We have solution architects and so on to help out with this. Uh, Franco. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no much to add to that. Um, I think it goes back to what you said at the beginning. I think it's probably the best advice is start small. Um, but as well, we have the capability of, because we are basically talking zero trust in and out with all of our major customers. We also have the capability to provide that level of consultancy with professional services as well. So we have both options. Great, thank you. And, and I said that was the last question. We do have one more that has just come through. Um, are there any sample playgrounds that we can use to see the integrations of the HashiCorp security products as a sample boilerplate, for example? Mm -hmm. So we have, let's say like these labs for each product. So if you go to our uh, website, um, developer.hashcop.com, we see that we have several tutorials there, uh, there and some quick starts of those products. And they allow you to just, you know, try out the product, things like that. Uh, the open source side of things, you're able to download and just run in your own laptop and try that out, that's one. Uh, but we also have specific labs on a platform that we call Instruct, where you, you're able to try out with all of the, these products. If you want to have a sample, let's say a, a try of all of this, then please reach out to your you know, account manager or to the to a solutions engineer. So that there was a link there in the presentation that in terms of that you can book a workshop also uh, with us, then we can come in and then you know you can have hands-on keyboard, have an explanation of what's going on and so on. So that one, yeah, the, the second one. Great. Thank you, Ricardo. And a nice segue into the next steps. So um, we do have three kind of next steps that we've outlined for you. If you'd like to learn more about Zero Trust Security and the HashiCorp security portfolio. So the first one is if you are based in the UK, we have our Zero Trust Strategy Day taking place on the 26th of January. That will be hosted at Shangri-La at the Shard, a very nice venue. We'll have our field CTO, Sarah Poland, there as well. We'll be walking through how you can implement a Zero Trust strategy within your organization. We'll also have a number of customers there as well, giving their view on how they have done that successfully with HashiCorp tools. The second is that if you are a developer yourself or you have developers within your team, you can book a private workshop uh, for those developers where, as Ricardo said, you can get hands on keyboard and start to experience some of those tools for yourself, whether that's Vault, Console or both or any of our other products for that matter. And third and lastly is if you want to get started on uh, the HashiCorp tools, you can do so most quickly, most simply through using the HashiCorp cloud platform that is available as a service. And as I said, all of those links will be available to you after this session. So you can register for those events. You can get started on HCP uh, whenever you have the time. So with that, we'd conclude today's webinar. So thank you very much for attending. Just a reminder that this session was recorded and we'll share that with you along with the content and the slides that you've seen today within the next 48 hours. And with that, I really hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everyone.